Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the San Francisco Playhouse, to our community's empathy gym. I'm Bill English, the artistic director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our series of five fireside chats with some of America's greatest playwrights. Um, I met our playwright we're going to talk to tonight in New York. Uh, a couple times we've hung out in New York and talked about theater and art and life, and we've had like long ranging like two hour conversations about most everything. Uh, before I met this playwright, I had read uh, a play of his and I was probably less than halfway through it when I green lighted it. It was just so compelling. And it just took my breath away in so many different ways that I, I, was, I knew the rest of it was gonna be brilliant. And of course it was. And uh, so then, uh, we reached out to Rogelio about doing it and uh, in the sandbox. And many of you, many of you saw Born in East Berlin. And uh, it was a, just a tremendously successful production, extremely well reviewed. Uh, we had some, um, some help with our executive producer, Cynthia Bogolub that was on that show. And we had a tremendous crew, Margaret Perry, directing Teddy Holsker on sound, a fabulous cast. And it was just, it was just an, an it was sort of a picture postcard uh, play development uh, situation. So I was so thrilled to have done it and uh, hoping we get to work together again. But I'd like to introduce to you without any further ado, Rogelio Martinez. Thank you, Bill, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. It's a crazy time. It's a crazy it week. Yeah. It's, uh, it seems like time has sort of stopped. It has, hasn't it? It yeah, has. It does it, seem that it, it's, you know, the, the terrible calamity recently, you know, in Minneapolis, George Floyd has just really rocked, rocked the world socks. It's just totally knocked us for a loop and I think we're all kind of stunned and grief stricken and struggling. Yeah, we're all I think we're, yeah, we're all in a very difficult place in trying to figure it all out for ourselves and what what we can do and what our place is as far as artists. And um, and so there's been a lot of soul searching. And I I can say that for myself and I can say that for other artists who I've spoken to. And it's like what can we do? How how can we put our art to work in ways that um, can sort of help carry forth this conversation and at the same time solve some problems? And so that's that's been happening a lot. That's been happening. I've been dealing with that myself. Right. Well, we're really talking about racism and, and its effects yeah. and it's kind of the way it's embedded in our culture. And uh, we're also, these are, these are facts that, that you know about and that what are some of the things you've been hearing or the, some of the things you've been thinking about actions that a theater or a, or a playwright can, well, can take to, to help? Well, you know, I, I, when I think about plays and when I think about writing plays and when I think about writing contemporary plays, because this is, this is happening, this is, this is changing every day, something new, a new detail. So what I do is sort of I pull back and I say, okay, what is the story that's going on here? What is the larger story? And then, and then I start to look around and I start to poke around moments in history that are not necessarily the same, but similar. Um, and it so happens that today is the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square where uh, pro-democracy yeah. movement and so that's been very much on my mind. Uh, what these people were demanding was accountability. They were demanding freedom of the press, freedom to protest. They were, it was a pro-democracy movement. And when I look at what's going on today, uh, the demands are somewhat similar. And, uh, and the reaction uh, on June 4th, uh, the Chinese government declared uh, martial law. Listen, we're not that far away from that kind of response. And that to me is frightening. So as a writer, I want the audience to collaborate with me. I want us to work together. I don't 
I don't want to write the play. I want them to put it together. And so if I were to approach it, I would probably be attracted to something like the Tiananmen Square in order to create the conversation and say, well, this is what was going on in a different country 30 years ago. What's going on in our country? How did they solve it? Did they not solve it? Did they take a step forward, a step back? And, um, and a lot of this is sort of similar to, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Brecht. We've talked about this. And I think he did a lot of the same things, which was he took a contemporary problem and he set it in, a, in, 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 in somewhere in a historical past, uh, Mother Courage being a very, very good example of it. And, uh, but he was addressing the present. And I think that's, that's my approach to this kind of, um, this kind of horrible uh, state we find ourselves in. Yeah. Well, you, you know, uh, you've done that. You've done that a number of times. Most yeah. recently, laudably with, with Born in East Berlin, and I, yeah. I think just getting up out of bed in the morning and reading the newspaper, I, I find found myself thinking of Born in East Berlin. I like. I tell. I'll t I always say this: is I, I think, I think playwrights. I think of playwrights, you know, who I adore individually and as a group as the, the prophets of our time, because I mean, you guys have sort of more sensitive antenna than the rest of us. And you, you pick up on stuff that's happening in the, in the tumult and are able somehow to, to distill it into a, a story that we can use to see ourselves. So, you know, just, uh, just clearing the Lafayette park with the helicopters and the, yeah, the, the whole thing. It, it does remind me a little of, of, of the Stasi along yeah. there, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a definitely, you know, my, my friend lives near that area and she said she couldn't sleep because uh, helicopters all night. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you know, when I was researching East Berlin, there were these moments when you would learn that suddenly all the, 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 the lights would flood what's called a death strip when someone was trying to leave. And there's a scene that sort of touches on that in the play. And when I get these images of these helicopters and these, the, the lights being flooded on people who are protesting peacefully uh, uh, for the most part. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it's been, it's, it's part of history. It's happened before. And it's happening here and it's happening uh, and it will continue to happen unless things uh, change and they need unless to. we change them of course unless we change it yeah we change them yeah yeah, yeah. but I'm really I think a, the, the story of where born in East Berlin came from for those of you who don't know the born in East Berlin revolves around a concert that Bruce Springsteen gave yeah. not long before the fall of the, of the of the Berlin Wall and a couple of women that were involved in that story. One who was sort of the front person he sent in to negotiate with this totalitarian regime and the other a girl that he pulled up on stage and who was who was then harassed and and actually in fact, right? By, yeah. by the Nazi, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the way that one came about was that I was writing a different play um, uh, which happens a lot, I think. You're writing one play and another one is just sort of banging the door, wanting to get started. And you're like, you know, you're trying to push it away. But um, my daughter, I think at the time was maybe two uh, and I had her on my lap and I was working on a play about uh, Nixon You're going to China. And, uh, and so I was trying to indoctrinate her into good music. <laughs> and so I had a Springsteen con. I, I love writing in chaos, and so I had a Springsteen concert playing on part of my screen while I was typing away. And then I looked over, and she was watching, and it was dancing in the dark, and it was a concert. And I looked over, and I said, "No, I know my Springsteen. I don't know that concert." And so I sort of started to look at it, and I said, "This is East Germany. This is 1980." And, and and sort of like I became very curious, and this. It was dancing in the dark and a young woman goes up on stage and she trips. And I thought, and I thought, who is this girl? She must be feeling sort of the highlight of her life at this moment. 
And so I started to sort of dig in. I finished the other play and I started to research, trying to figure out how to tell the story. But it, it was handed to me by my daughter, basically. Um, by your two-year-old. Yeah, it was just handed to me by, uh, you know, so it was just a, it, 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 it came by organically. And it, it comes by the way that you, you plays are written, which is, uh, there's a question. And you need to know, here's the thing. When you write a play, you have a question that you want answered. If you have the answer at the top, don't write it because the audience will have the answer within 10 minutes. So hold on, you know, make sure you don't know the answer yet. And you're going to go on this journey and make sure it's going to take you about two years to figure out the answer. <laughs> you know, you're going to write it in one year and in another year, you're going to workshop. It. And by the last workshop, that's when you want to figure out the answer. And then what's going to happen is that you're going to get it produced in the first day of previews. I'm going to turn to you, Bill. I'm going to say, this isn't working. The audience, they're, they're the last collaborators. They're telling me something's off. And then what we did was we uh, what we did with Berlin, we 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 moved things around, we shifted things, and uh, and so so you know it's a it's a long collaboration, and it starts with a question that you know it's going to take some time to answer. So that's well, what's, the, what's the question of Born in East Berlin? Well, my my question with Born in East Berlin was why did they allow this? Why did they allow American rock music? to walk into East Berlin knowing the dangers it could have. Um, and, and, and I had to sort of go into the mind of young people at that time in the uh, Eastern Bloc countries. And then I had to go into the mind of people who were present at the birth of East, uh, of East Germany. These are people who fought in World War II. And so right. there's a radical shift from from the people who created the system to the to the, the grandchildren, basically. So I had to figure these people out and figure out what, what they were thinking and uh, how they were, they were all trying to survive and they were all doing it very differently. And, uh, and so that, that, that was the question. And I wanted to go, and you always want to go places you've never been to. And I've never been to East Berlin, nor can I go to East Berlin. So that's, that's the research. That's the fun part. I'm, I'm a tourist and I'm going to these wonderful places. So, um, so that was, you know, those were some of the ideas that were circling around the time that, uh, that, that, that I was writing the play. Yeah. You, you told me another story that's, that's based upon your youth as yeah. your childhood in, uh, in Cuba and yeah. how you were, tell us a little bit about how, about how that relates to, to born in East Berlin. Well, you know, uh, again, I try to remove myself, sometimes with my more, more personal plays, I sort of try to remove myself from, from the core, from the heart of it, so that I have this, I give everybody a fighting chance. I want to give everybody a fighting chance. If it had been about me in Cuba in 1980, uh, it had been about my family, the way that my family was broken apart, it, it would not have been as good of a play. Um, I needed to remove myself from it, but I needed to write about a state, uh, a totalitarian state. I needed to write about a place where information, information is key. It's, 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 it's everything, it's currency. And I also understood that East Berlin, Cuba, and I said to you, this is so great that it's opening in San Francisco, the heart of, uh, of Silicon Valley's there, you know, it's it's the heart of like uh, all this information that we're surrendering now. Um, my family was fighting to not surrender 30 years earlier. Um, I, you know, my mom used to say, anything that's said in this house cannot be said outside the house. And so that was the mentality that was sort of percolating in me when I was writing East Berlin. I didn't want to write that scene. I didn't want to write that child being told that by the mother. But too, I, close. too close. Too close. Too close. Yeah, too close. Um, so I wanted to move myself a little bit. And again, it goes back to the, where we started our conversation, which is I need to remove myself from the situation just ever so slightly. Um, I need to place the, the present in the past somehow. And then, and then what happens is that a conversation happens between past and present. 
So I love, I love the phrase uh, that you just used. Uh, give give everybody a fighting chance. Yeah. So it's yeah. It, like even the the characters that you don't like, right, or the characters that are you you want to let the characters express their own story rather than is that it then you rather yeah than i mean i want to i want to make sure that they they're they're heard i mean these are you know these people started in a place of incredible idealism and romanticism and so how did they go from there to sort of to to putting up a barrier to authorizing people trying to escape that to shoot and kill and so I had to go into those minds and how those minds, how power corrupts as time passes, we get further and further away from the ideas that make us this amazing democracy. And, and we forget, we lose sight of that. And, um, and I think uh, East Germany did that. I think they began in one place and uh, they slowly realized that they couldn't, they, they, they they couldn't think it through. Uh, power just corrupted these people. And so, but I needed to give them that chance, yeah. Right, right. Well, I, 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 was, I was quite, I was quite, I, I didn't expect this from reading it, but then uh, when we started working on it in rehearsal and in, you know, mostly when I came around, we were in like tech and dress rehearsals and previews, but, the, I, I did feel that idealism still trying to stay alive in the, in the women, particularly yeah. Yeah. The, the East German, uh, the Stasi yeah. women that were very, you know, they were, they were, they were still trying to, to, to sort of create an ideal society. Yeah. And that's, I, that made it, that made them human, human yeah. beings instead of just kind of cardboard, cardboard villains. I mean, we can all look back on that time and think, oh my God, they were so deluded. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it, it, it's, it, listen, when you write a play, you have to fall in love with all your characters. It, um, and when you fall in love with someone, you fall in love for all their greatness, but you accept all their flaws. And so uh, don't write a play that you're not willing to fall in love. You can break up once you write the end. <laughs> this is not a marriage, right? This is a relationship. So yeah, yeah. You could there break is a up, way but, out. Yeah. There is a way out, and it's called the next play. But uh, but you know, you do have to be you do have to fall in love with all your characters, and uh, so that you give you 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 give everybody that chance. Um, and you surprise yourself. You can you need to surprise yourself. And that's 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 the delight in writing. I think is when you I surprise. It, I think it's true that the it's like you say when you say surprise yourself. I think that you're surprised because you you give up trying to control what the character does. You know, yeah. like yeah. like they do things that 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 you just your you know your hands are on the keys of your computer or your on your ballpoint pen if you write if you work by hand and. And it's just the characters sort of take over yeah. and do what they do. Yeah, no, I mean, at some point, and it, and it sounds it's sort of like, but at some point they do take over. They, 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 they you know, I have a, a, another play um, where I, I always tell writers, I say, characters are going to step forward and say, this is my play. They're going to tell you that. So you might start writing a play about these two people and then someone's going to step forward and say, no, this is my play. And that's happened to me. You know, characters step in and, and, and sometimes they step in on page 15 and they say, this is my play. And East Berlin is an interesting case in that two different storylines were fighting for the same play. And so that was one of the challenges of the play. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the challenges of the play. I, could, I imagine that was a huge challenge for you as a designer. Two storylines were fighting. And I knew these two storylines had to cross. So what happened was um, the first storyline being a, a young couple uh, who are in love and uh, one is considering leaving East Berlin. And then the second story has to do with uh, the, the American coming to secure the concert. Right. 
it, it, I knew that stories had to link, but I, I didn't know how. And then one day I was writing the scene, the young woman was listening to the album, in comes this woman, and it's the woman from the other, from the other storyline. And it's her it's sister. The sister. And I say, wow, okay, now we have a play, right? Now we have a play. But it, I didn't, didn't plan it that way. I did not plan it that way. Um, so you just have to, you just have to let them tell you what, what is the story. Yeah, well, it's, it's very epic. It's very Shakespearean in the sense yeah. that they got this tapestry of this incredible historic event. Yeah. You know, the concert. And then against that tapestry, you've got all these people who are trying to be in love, yeah. who are basically kind of thwarted by, by the lack of ability to trust or the, the lack of ability to, to be free enough to actually give and get love, you know? So it's like, I, I remember I always thought of it as that there were three love stories in the, in, in the play, you know, and uh, that they, that they do cross, they do, they do, they do cross paths. And I, I know, I remember watching it and, 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 you know, you'd say, well, who's the protagonist, right? right? Like a drama critic or a, yeah. or like, uh, let's call me the dramaturg yeah. would say, I would say to Rogelio, I would say, well, well, who is the protagonist in this play? Cause I hadn't really figured it out yet. And, and I think you, I think we were, we were sitting at a little outdoor cafe with Margaret and you said, well, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. And I actually love that answer. Yeah. You know, because there was no single protagonist in that story. No. There were um, at least two. No. And, and that happens a lot with my plays because they're about big, they have a big historical backdrop in them. And uh, there are these competing storylines. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you know, Robert Altman, Nashville, one of the great films of all time. You have like 20 plus characters and who is the protagonist? And um, somebody else told me this story. Oh God, I forgot who it was. It was a great playwright. Um, you know that when you see a play uh, that has a lot of uh, characters, different ages, um, what happens is that each audience member, depending on their age, thinks the play is about that person. Sure. Uh, and I didn't, this is not me, someone, you know, very brilliant playwright told me this. And, um, and it's that's true, when you, have, when you write these plays where, uh, and that's important, uh, uh, different ages uh, on stage is really critical. And when you have that, audiences say, no, this is their play. This is, this is their play. And, uh, and so that happens as well. Um, but, and then the other thing, Bill, that happens in the development of a play is that you fall in love with an actor in workshops. And right. You say, and you fall in love with their voice and you say, this person, I, I want to write more for this person. And so it's this kind of strange relationship where you're writing this play and an actor comes in and is giving you their all. And you say, they're, this actor is fighting for this play. I want to work with them. I want, and, and that, that happens as well. So, uh, you know, so. Well, it'll change, it'll change the play too, right? Yeah. And once, they, once the play collides with specific actors, yeah. you know, it changes. Yeah. It changes. I, think, I mean, I, I think the important thing is that as a, as a writer, um, the, 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 everybody, it's a collaboration. We have to understand that. We have to understand that you can't solve it all in the dialogue. Um, we have to be generous towards our collaborators. And I think that if, if you are, uh, have that in mind and you can remove your ego from that, um, then, then the play works because everybody's equally invested. Right. And, um, and uh, you share equal credit. And ultimately my, my best work um, it hasn't, it, it's happened because so many good people have contributed to it. Um, so many good people, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it was really a, let's talk about the little, a little bit about the way we got into Born. Yeah. You came out for auditions once, right? Yeah, yeah. And we auditioned all the actors. And then when you came back, it was the first week of rehearsal, I think. It was right? the first 
week of, I think a few days of rehearsal had occurred and then I, and then I came in. Yeah. So how did that, did that, did that make you feel like, like changing things or mixing stuff up at that point? Not too I, much, huh? Yeah, no, I think it's, I, I think at that point you just want to see what, 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 what are the chips you've been given to play and you want to just, right. you want to breathe, you know, because the instinct of the writer is I'm going to go home and, and fix it. There's no fixing to do. There's listening. You need to listen. You need to take a breath and you need to listen. Um, and you need to give them is a, a, a little bit of room and a little bit of chance uh, that, that you gave yourself in the writing. So you got to give their, you got to trust their process a little bit. Um, and then as it moves forward into the second week, you start to sense you know, what, what's not working in the play, what is working, and then you start to sort of dig in. Uh, with East Berlin, a lot of it had to do with scene placement um, and, and just where scenes were placed. There's a scene that always, always worked. In any workshop that we did of that play, it always worked. It was a funny scene, it always worked. And it was the second or third, of, it was the third scene of the first act and then we got into rehearsals and deep into rehearsals and I think even previews and, we, and the scene wasn't working. It wasn't that it wasn't, it, something was stopping the play. The scene itself was fine, but something was, the scene was stopping the momentum of the play. And I think, I don't know how we, you know, this was a, but I said, we have to do some, we got to put the scene in the second act. We got to do a bunch of shuffling and God, we did that all in the period of 24 hours, and I'm being very generous for 24 hours because I'm going to say it was eight hours, and uh, it, it was really something. And, and you know, yeah. you called me up and you said, "Hey, I want to move that scene to Act Two. I want to move that scene to Act One. I want to cut this scene all together and rewrite the second half of that scene." And we were we were in previews. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that was like second preview. We'd yeah, see, no. and it's, it's funny how you need. You need to see it almost in front of an audience too. You know that's what previews are so good for with a world premiere. Is you get you get an audience reacting, and there were certain things that they weren't getting. Yeah, they just weren't getting it. And 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 God, what a great cast, huh? What a yeah. what a great bunch. I mean, you you go up to a bunch of actors in their third preview and tell them you're going to shuffle the whole play around and cut scenes and add scenes and move scenes, and and the tech people who had written all the cues for the whole play. God, yeah, and and what a heroic bunch they were, yeah, and um, and as you said, I mean, these things happen in previews, and there's a reason we call them previews, and not just simply so that the actors have a chance to work in front of it, it's so that we have a chance to work as well. And I listen to the what I listen to the rhythm of the audience, and you can understand, you can sort of hear when the audience is together, because I think the 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 you know I always say. I always say to writers, I say, you need to get a laugh in the first five minutes of a play because an, a laugh unifies, a laugh unifies. How, how do you know two people have fallen in love when they laugh at a joke it's not funny? You know, they, they laugh together and it's a joke it's not funny. You know they're in love. Uh, you need that audience to fall in love with the play. You need to fall and you need to get that laugh. And once you've gotten that laugh, you can you can listen and you can hear and you can look at the way they're moving in the audience to see when the breakup happens and then when the breakup happens that's that's what you study why did they break up and how can i get them to get back together it's a love affair we you know we who, who practice theater on are in, are in love with the art form and uh and 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 we share it with other people and and we try to figure out these puzzles and it's 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 all fun, Bill. It's all fun. It's why we do it. What a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. Gosh, it's it's a love affair that we have with storytelling and with yeah. and with theater and with actors and with directors and with all the talented people. Yeah. What a beautiful. That's a great way to to conclude. You, yeah. you see, he's a writer. He, he you, you you gave me you gave me a good closer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Rahelio. Thank yeah, you. It's such a pleasure you. to see you, even if we, you know, Zoom and. Uh, yeah, this and, is better uh, than nothing. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely better than nothing. And uh, much love to uh, 
your wonderful city and your wonderful Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to us being able to do something again, too. We'd like to maybe come up with a commission and see what sort of uh, yeah, historical, historical event we can explore in terms of its contemporary yeah. resonance, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank really, you. really appreciate it. All enjoy, right. Cheers. Enjoy Vermont and I'll see you soon. All right. Cheers, Bill. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in to our fireside chats with America's great playwrights, Rogelio Martinez. Uh, what a what a wise and 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 uh, talented talented soul and uh, was really wonderful having you all with us tonight. Uh, this is what we're able to do right now since we're not able to put up a place. So we hope those of you who can will continue uh, the outpouring of support, support for San Francisco Playhouse has just been absolutely heartwarming and staggering. And uh, we, we very much hope that you will continue Next week on our Fireside Chat, we're going to have Dipika Guha, who many of you remember from the yoga play. We did two of her plays before that, though, in the sandbox. And, and she's a playwright that has, her voice has always very, very much resonated with me. And I, obviously, we produced three of her plays. So I'm really, really thrilled that she's going to be able to join us. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Cool. Oh, yeah. I could hear you fine.